Okay, what does this have to do with the least squares? Well, here's what it is. Let's calculate this matrix. Not so much calculate, but figure out a matrix expression for it. If the basis B was given in R3, suppose we had something like this. B equals, let's give this matrix a letter, M. If B was, let's say, I can only hope that these vectors are linearly independent. They probably are. Okay, they're a little crooked, but that's okay. And suppose we're considering, you must ask me what in a product. So I'll just answer the standard in a product. A1, A B1 plus A2, B2 plus A3, B3. And then what would this matrix be? What would be the top left entry for the inner product matrix when the basis is this and the inner product is the standard inner product? 14. And you could calculate all the other entries, right? I completely agree. So now all I want is for you to capture it in matrix form, matrix notation. When you're able to do it, good things happen. Being able to express what you just said, part of what you just did, calculate the nine pairwise in the products. That's words, that's an algorithm, that works great. But if you're also able to write it down in matrix terms, good things happen. So suppose I captured this basis by putting it into a three by three matrix. Using this matrix B, could you express the matrix M? And if you could, what is that expression in terms of B? In a matrix product, so that the result is a three by three matrix full of these pairwise in a product of these vectors with respect to the standard in a product. B transpose B. Can you guys see why that is? B transpose takes these columns and makes them rows. So in this product we have rows of B here and columns of B here. So if you think through the mechanics of matrix multiplication, every entry, remember, is the dot product, as we used to call it, of the corresponding row with the corresponding column. And that's exactly the standard in a product of these basis vectors. And so to actually solve this problem, what's the answer? It's M inverse times this right-hand side, right? So in solving this problem, we have to invert the metric. We have to invert the matrix, the metric. So it's going to be B transpose B inverse. And now do you see how this is beginning to take on some, an additional meaning of what's happening here? So let's talk about that. Let me erase this part of the board and connect what, we're talk what we were just talking about to the least squares problem. So we're now going to discuss the least squares problem and connect it to inner products and the metric matrix that we just discussed. So when you're in the least squares mode, you're dealing with a system where you have too many equations for the number of unknowns that you have. Or from the more fruitful interpretation of linear decomposition, you have to represent this vector as a linear combination of these vectors, of the columns of the matrix, and you just don't have enough to span the whole space. So there's almost no chance that the right-hand side is in the span of the columns of this matrix, or in other words, it's column space. So we can describe it the following way. If we call the columns of A, A1, A2, A3, we can think of it as almost as a basis wannabe. So it's going to look like this, 3 by 8, something like that. So I can't possibly call this a basis because there aren't enough vectors. But it's certainly a basis for the three-dimensional span to which the right-hand side does not belong. Okay, so the formula that we end up with 
is this formula. That's interesting. That's, we're not rederiving that right now. We somehow derived this on pure algebraic grounds, but now we're just going to reinterpret it. So let's reinterpret it. How would you reinterpret the expression A transpose B? So we know that to solve that problem in the least square sense, we have to calculate A transpose B. So how would you reinterpret A transpose B? A transpose B is what we need to evaluate. Okay, well let me ask you this question. If I had my column B, and these are my A1, A2, A3, how would I capture it by a matrix expression? So let their letter A denote both the collection of columns and this matrix. Sort of one and the same thing in a way. It's just difference of how you think about it. A. If I wanted to dot B with each one of these columns, how would I capture it by a matrix? Yeah. A transpose B. Totally correct. Do you guys see that? You just have to, to make it conform to the definition of matrix multiplication. You have to turn these guys into rows. So you have to transpose A. And then when you multiply A transpose, the rows of A by the matrix B, you will get exactly A transpose B. A transpose B will exactly capture the three inner products of B with A1, with A2, and with A3. Well, I have nothing to write because it's already written. Do you see it's, it's written right here. So the recipe that this now calls for is the following. If you want to find the best solution of B for B as a linear combination of the vectors of the vectors to the span of which it does not belong, you simply have to dot it with each one of those vectors and then multiply it by the inverse of the met of the of the metric. I keep trying to avoid to say gram matrix because that's what it is, but I don't like that name. The metric. I'm just going to call it the inner product matrix. There you go. That's the compromise. And then you have to multiply it by the inverse of the inner product matrix. So do you see that it's the exact same recipe as there was when we were decomposing with respect to a legitimate basis B? So when we, when we face the feasible problem of decomposing with respect to a legitimate basis B, the recipe was dot it with each one of the basis elements and then multiply it by the inverse of the inner product matrix. That's the criterion we arrived at. But now we're, and that was perfectly natural. I want agreement from everybody. We followed the one procedure we could have with inner products and arrived at this AX equals B. So yes, it's this times the inverse of this inner product matrix. Totally natural. So that's when we did, when we were doing decomposition with respect to a legitimate basis. But when we don't have a legitimate basis, when we only have something aspiring to a basis, not enough elements to be a basis, just enough elements to be a subspace of a basis. And we're now solving this problem, which is not feasible, but can be solved in the lesser sense of providing the answer so that you're as close to B as possible without actually being B. The strategy is exactly the same. Project well, I, it's too early to say project because we don't have a geometric interpretation yet. But dot with each one of these elements and then multiply by the inverse of the inner product matrix for the subspace spanned by these vectors. The exact same recipe. And the only point that I'm trying to make is that whatever may not have made sense before looked a little bit cumbersome and looked like the most complicated matrix expression you have ever seen is actually completely natural. Because it works because the recipe that it yields is exactly the same as the recipe we came, we came up with when we had a legitimate basis and restricted ourselves to using the inner products to solve the decomposition problem. 